Okay, welcome back. Thank you for still being here. Uh, we start now with our panel discussion. Um, we thought to start us as organizers with a, with a question, a provocative question to break the ice. And later on, the, there would be Lana there with a microphone that will go around. So raise your hand af afterwards and she will bring it to you and there will be discussion with the audience as well. So to start with, I would like to, to address the whole panel and, and, and ask, uh, since most of you are, are uh, um, active researchers uh, and you're scientists, all of you are striving for, for uh, open access in a way or the other. Uh, but on the basis of which then do you choose to which journal submit your research? Because all of you, or some of you that we are aware of uh, are still publishing in non-open access and high impact uh, journals. So what is, what is the, the strive for this in practice as a scientist also? Well, okay. <laughs> so, is that the mic first? <laughs> No, I think it would be a bit dishonest to say this is purely out of some, I don't know, altruistic reason of improving the publishing landscape. Yes, I mean, we all submit, or I, I don't know, at least for myself, I do submit to journals or even to quantum. And don't worry, there's no conflict of interest. We have a lot of <laughs> systems in place to prevent this. However, uh, of course, I think, uh, and that's one of the main problems we sought to address is we still kind of need, you know, like to maintain the research group to get tenure, we still kind of need... Uh, all of these basic metrics, we need to get our papers into journals that are well respected and unfortunately impact factor is still a proxy for respect in the community. So I think this is a problem that uh, I openly admit to, like sometimes you know you send your stuff to Nature and PRL and all of these things and I even, well I'm not even tenured but even if I was I would, I'd still be submitting with students and postdocs that are not and that could highly benefit from this so it's a it, we need a way to break this vicious cycle i would say um, i agree for for me one of the reasons i uh, chose the path in academia that i chose was to have the freedom to do the research that i wanted to do so i continue to do research i continue to publish my venue of publication for physics is basically decided by my co-authors and I let them uh, choose to publish wherever they think is best uh, for their careers. Uh, in anything where I'm talking about open access or anything where I'm uh, thinking about more of the digital science focused stuff that I work in, I will always choose an open access publication. And again, because I don't need to worry about progression in a certain sense, um, I just choose um, wherever is the nicest open access journal at the moment. Um, well, for me, I'm an old man by now. I've kind of been there, done that. I got the ERC advance, so what more can I have? So I'm completely free, you know. I would never again publish in, uh, uh, in the old venues if it was just of me. There's no question about it, because in my uh, career, I've suffered so much from having to write and rewrite and put theatricals and smoke and mirrors on my papers for them to get into a thing. <laughs> Uh, in fact, just a little anecdote, at some point I uh, had the result which I thought was the best result in my group for uh, like a solid decade. And we tried in one glossy, I didn't go through, and tried another glossy, then go through, tried a top drone, then go through, then I tried another drone, it didn't go through. So in my experience, the very best papers I have are the ones that are the toughest to publish. And um, actually, at some point, just for fun, I computed the amount of time that we had spent writing and rewriting and replying to reports and things like that. And it was bigger than the time we had actually spent performing the research. And then I said, never again. And that's essentially when I started SciPost. <laughs> so um, these days, I do like you. I let my juniors decide where they want to publish. I put the cards on the table. They know exactly where I stand. They know exactly what I think. They have grave worries about their careers, of which I'm freed. And, you know, I let them cho choose because for them it's too impactful. So I think we need to, like, break them out of jail because they don't make the choices for the right reasons. Yeah? 
as I'm a librarian, if I publish, I publish in a librarian information journals. And to be honest, I even don't know if they have an impact factor or how high is the impact factor. For me, it's important that they are open access because what I want for my publications is visibility. And visibility is much higher in open access journals and therefore I only publish open access. When I started <clears throat> advocating for open access, yeah, five, six, seven years ago, um, I was listening to a lot of the voices in the advocacy space and the internet, and there are some who are extremely fundamentalist about it and really saying that you have to have purity and you have to do it the right way. And then there are some more moderate voices who say that, you know, you can think this is important, you can raise awareness, you can try to go in this direction as much as you can, but you don't have to fall on that sword yourself. You don't have to sacrifice your own career as a young researcher um, just to make open access a reality. It's not your responsibility alone. It's the, the older people who hold the power in the system. Um, so I do publish in the way that's best for, for my career. And now I'm slowly getting to a point where I'm starting to have a career. And then, yeah, it will be the, my juniors, my students, and so on. Um, but Austria. The FWF and, and also University of Vienna has very good policies. It's very easy to publish open access. Yes, it's still largely hybrid, uh, but at least the articles you're publishing are open. And the FVF, of course, mandates this. And, and ERC recommends it. And yeah, I think they're going to mandate it as well in the future. So it is important, but, but you know, it's not every young person's responsibility to. Career, uh, commit career suicide just to make the world more open. You can do it in more incremental ways and just raising awareness with your co-authors, that, that can be an important step. Yeah, um, I completely agree and maybe to add my own anecdote to that as a social scientist who studies publication behavior and who is also studying how impact factors um, impact people's publication behavior. One thing that is kind of ironic, you always are, to a certain extent, your own um, object of observation, so to say. Um, and that has some irony sometimes, because I have to say, when I was thinking about the question, I also, there's one very nice paper that I wrote that would have been perfect for a very nice kind of grassroots uh, open access um, journal in our field. And I consciously chose not to kind of submit it there, but to a high impact journal because I needed it for kind of to complete my tenure agreement with this university. Um, and, you know, that is the kind of the irony of being critical and writing about this. Actually, the paper is even about this, partly. Um, so it goes, it goes full circle. Um, but uh, it actually kind of really wants, I want, really want to support it by saying, well, it's about individual decisions, but we all can only make individual decisions in the framework conditions that we get set by our institutions. And so I think that is really important to kind of also get the way to change the way the tenure agreements look, to change the way that how we evaluate each other also when we look at the grant applications and so on and so forth. Of course. Just a quick direct response. I mean, I, coming from physics, I don't even understand this section of the debate. Everything we do is anyway open access. I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, the first battle was already won with the establishment of the archive and with forcing the journals to accept archiving the papers even prior to publication. I mean, that's the whole point, right? The reason we are, came up with this journal from, like, I'm young, so like from the time I started publishing, the archive existed and was kind of self-evident that every article you ever produce is first put in the archive and then sent to a journal. So journals, for me, are this weird quality factor stamp that you put below your archive. So everything is open access anyway. That's not the issue. The issue is about, for me, it's about financing and policies and who gets the power of decision making of uh, which results are important, how to obtain tenure and these kind of things. But like, I think open access for me is not the issue. I'm a big fan of archive and everything I publish, I put on archive as well. But I have to say that there are differences between publishers. Some publishers do very heavy copy editing. They make the text clearer. They help it make, make it more, more accessible. There are more hands-on and more hands-off editing processes. Whether they should cost as much as they do, of course, this we can discuss. But I think there is a, 
there's a danger of being a little bit too naively bashing of publishers that they do nothing of value and you know this could all be done for free and uh, of course you're not suggesting it's completely for free but yeah there, there are differences and I think the discussion needs to become more nuanced and that's what Plan S is trying to do. There should be transparency about how much of this APC is going for editing services, uh, copy editing images, whatever. There should be a cost breakdown. What are you actually paying for when you pay this amount? And I don't think many publishers could justify their current APCs if they had to provide an actual breakdown. Thank you. Uh, let me just introduce myself very sh shortly. I did my master's degree 55 years ago in Göttingen, and more than 50 years ago I did a, my doctoral degree in Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, both in physics and later I went into environmental and health uh, regulations and uh, many other things. Now, uh, in, in this discussion, what I missed a little bit um, is a question of quality of research. Um, because uh, we are uh, in a rather comfortable situation here in Europe, but let's look also around the world. And uh, um, I found interesting the proposal or point of Jean-Sébastien Co uh, um, about the importance of markets. Yes, I agree with you. Um, of course, markets anywhere are or should be regulated. You must regulate against fraud, against um, risks um, of uh, different types. Uh, the question is, how would you organize that? Because all of us, we know that there is excellent science, good science, mediocre science, and bad science. Let, let me make a comparison with the health services and medicine. You have uh, scientific medicine, good health services, and so on, on the one hand, and you have extremely bad or non-existent health services. Um, do we want to um, deliver ourselves to the shamans in uh, medicine? No. So please, could you just explain a little bit how would this academic organization ensure quality in science. Um, if I may, yeah. so, um, so, so two points to, aggre uh, to address. First of all, the, the quality uh, keyword and then the market keyword. Let me start with the quality one. Like I said in my talk, and I really use this occasion to emphasize it very strongly, I'm a very, very strong believer in refereeing. A very, very strong believer in the added layer of peer verification, reproduction and stuff. I'm a very strong believer that um, many of the things that are put forward for science are incorrect or perhaps uh, at least in need of, uh, you know, improvement. Very few things uh, don't need a substantial iteration before being published. And the reason why it's good to do so before the moment of publication is that we end up with a corpus which is much more filtered, much more high quality. And in the end, that's just time saving. Um, I understand the propensity of putting everything out on the open immediately, and blah, 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 but you create a jungle, you create a mess, you create something which is not properly curated. I believe in refereeing, I believe in curation. So just you know, distill the things into the quality. So that's as far as the quality is concerned. And even, for example, the overall quality of the papers on the archive that you see today is really a reflection of the existence of proper peer refereeing protocols over decades yeah, and people's habits to make sure that before they put it on the archive, they already know that it can survive somebody's refereeing somewhere. So I don't want full openness like that. I really believe in uh, uh, the power of criticism. That's why I'm a scientist, because I criticize everything the whole bloody time. And I do think it's annoying, but it does serve a purpose. Yeah, so that's the quality part of your answer. Now, if I go to the market part of your answer, like I said, I'm a, I'm a, believe in a believer in markets when things are marketable. Um, <clears throat> however, if I think of scientific publishing as a market, then there are a number of uh, very problematic things that show up. Um, 
Uh, let's imagine a future in which uh, APCs indeed uh, are let to run their wild course and publishers can really uh, say attach teams of editors to your thing, they will even reproduce your data, they will uh, pump up your code and whatnot. And in the end to do that, it, um, uh, it costs them 100,000 euros. And that's what they charge you with uh, 36, call it 40% profit margin, 140,000 euros. That's the bill that I get. I sit down, I do a calculation, and I know that if I get such a paper, my chances of getting uh, 2.5 million grant are improved by more than, say, you know, 15, 20%. Do I pay the bill? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so, so uh, the point is that scientific publications, they're like jewels, they're like sports cars, they're like, you know, luxury watches and things like that. And the top price uh, is unbounded, and the manufacturing price has got nothing to do with the market price. And that's the reason why markets in publishing fail. It's the first fundamental reason. The second fundamental reason is you can ask yourself, where does the worth of the object come from? I do believe that there is worth in metadata. I'm very serious about metadata services. I'm very serious about what we do at Cypost with, uh, as publishers. Yeah? But I do not, for a second, uh, pretend that what we do comes anywhere near the worth of the work of the authors, the discovery that's described in there, the, the toil that was put in there. So if we're going to go market on this, let's open it up. Everybody gets a market, like I joke in my things, it, you know, I, I want to be paid for my refereeing uh, work also, I want to be uh, maybe even marketed on that. If I do a better job as a referee, I want to be paid more. Maybe I want to be marketed as an author as well, you know, so um, the reason why I don't want to have markets in publishing is because, uh, first of all, the price, the execution manufacturing price has got nothing to do with the actual price which can be charged. And second, if you're going to go market, you go market across the whole board, yeah, including the researchers. Just a very quick comment. Where does the quality come from? Quality comes from other researchers, right? They decide what research is correct and how it should be improved and so on, not the publishers. The publishers organize currently the peer review, but there's no reason why the community couldn't organize peer review. And so the quality, keeping the high quality doesn't necessarily involve big commercial publishers and big profits. But I do agree with the other speakers. We need to have solid peer review and that's now, now maybe less, but an early misconception about open access is that there is no, no quality controls. And that's just not true. Not anymore, at least. Next question. Hi, my name is Patrick. I'm the manager of the library of the Institute of Science and Technology Austria. And I have a question about the archive issue. I hear regularly everything is on the archive. Yes. But then uh, I got it. Also, I want to... I got the usage data of journals and then I want to cancel them. And I, then I have with the same person who's saying everything is on the archive a discussion about no, you can't cancel this journal because it's maybe one of their favorite society, it's maybe one of the, they're liking the publishers or whatever. Um, so there's no market issue to buy the journal anymore and there is, this is a non-open journal. So I would prefer to pay this money to anything that is open, uh, open access, even maybe give the money to archive, but I can't because it's still needed. Can somebody, uh, somebody explain me when everything is on the archive, why I still need the journals? <laughs> I mean, for me personally, for instance, I don't have any journal access, but this is due to our institution, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, However, there are ways to get articles. No, but there is one fundamental issue that has not been addressed, which is history, right? We might transition to open access and even force the big publishers to be open access for all forthcoming publications. However, there is, there is, a, there is a whole, I mean, at least in, in mathematics and physics, uh, like articles from the 70s or even earlier can still be relevant. Right? And sometimes you want to read them. And this is weird because for those you would still have to pay and they're not on the archive. So I think that, that's actually an issue of open access. I think there, there needs to be some mechanism to make uh, old publications publicly accessible. I don't know if there is such a thing set up. 
So I have a little bit of experience with this. We have a product in our portfolio called ReadCube. And we did some testing with University of Utah, I think it was about five years ago, where we replaced their uh, journal subscriptions to a number of journals with a kind of fund. And every time an academic wanted to access to one of the papers, it was for them invisible. But what we were really doing behind the scenes was we were going and paying for the article and bringing it back to them so it looked like seamless delivery. But we then compared that with the cost of subscription and, and single article kind of access. Of course, once an academic had bought an article, then the, the test that we were doing effectively cashed that article for the institution to use because they paid for it. So these types of models, we found out that actually you can save money and it can, it can work. But the, um, the overhead of putting the technology in place just for a small number of institutions is quite high. And so I think, as you say, historical articles are the ones you really want. I think a lot of physicists um, like to uh, subscribe to things like IOP, because Institute of Physics, because they feel that that's part of the infrastructure that's, you know, scholarly society, they're supporting us, we should support them. But I think that um, you, you see very, uh, very eminent institutes. I mean, Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton, they no longer subscribe to any journals. It's, it's all archive, all open access, and that's what they will do. And so you see some people starting to make that transition. And I think that we will see more of that. Maybe just one word. Uh, remember that Archive does not organize peer review. right? So the reason why you should support journals in one form or another is because you do believe in the quality stamp of peer review. So, uh, so, so that's one thing. Right? And also on the Archive, the, um, uh, the adoption percentage of Archive varies uh, tremendously between subfields, even of physics. Um, I would like to ask a question which is linked to the, the first answer that you gave to, to Flavio's question. So when he was asking how do you choose how to, uh, wh where to submit your papers, and many of them had just said, okay, I, I do agree, I do admit that I do submit in, in this type of journals, or I let my students choose whatever they feel is best, but what is best? And then he was referring to the impact factor. Now, the impact factor, it's it's supposed to be reflecting the average number of citation of the articles that are submitted in a journal. And so in principle, it does not assess the quality of each single article, but nevertheless, uh, it ends up to give some sort of uh, market power to the uh, journals with the highest impact factor. So, so together with the open accessibility of the material, the impact factor is also perhaps to be listed among the problems of scientific publishing. And this is not just solved with open accessibility. So, how would you address this issue? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so let me. Uh, I, I know impact factor is criticized all over the place. I don't like the impact factor at all. But let's just. Uh, I like thinking about it as well. So. What does it mean for a journal to have a higher impact factor? It could be that they have better editorial processes in place. It could be that they have more stringent editors and referees in place. It could be that they're actually doing a good job and that you can measure that. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe not. It's not because you're there. There have been studies uh, uh, for various uh, journals that have shown that indeed a few articles carry the whole justification for the impact factor and that you can only very, uh, uh, you know, with great difficulty predict which articles are going to break through, when they will, etc., etc., etc. But, okay, let's just put our kind of uh, uh, scientists' hats on again. What is the impact factor? The impact factor is an objectively defined, reproducible measure. So it's not bad. It's better than tweeting. If you ask me where the risk is, the risk is in the altmetrics. I absolutely never, ever will accept to be measured according to social media measures. Just forget about it. If any funding agency is thinking about that now, please don't go down that road, okay? And remember, is this recorded? Yes, please, <laughs> okay? Just don't do this dumb mistake. 
What's the problem with the impact factor? As a measure per se, there is no problem. The problem is that it is the only measure that we use. The problem is that it encourages people to stop thinking. So maybe what we need is to have better measures, more measures, including other things in there. Maybe we don't just want to look at citations. Maybe we want to be a little bit more smart into how we do it. But I think the kind of focus on bashing the impact factor obscures the debate about, uh, uh, about you know, metrification. Yeah, let's not be naive about this. Yes. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, I, I was going to say something nasty about impact factor instead. Um, <coughs> so, so, I mean, for, from my perspective, impact factor, just, just to bash it initially, is, is, is really uh, in part a measure of the size of the community. So you can't be totally objective about um, this impact versus that impact factor unless you understand the provenance, the background of the journal. So I completely agree with you. People look at the impact factor and they don't think. It's like me telling you that the paper has five citations and you're drawing a conclusion whether that paper is good or bad, not knowing how old it is, what the field is, all sorts of other contextual information. So I think the impact factor is, is, is vastly misused. I also kind of object to it on the grounds that people use it to make the choice of where to publish. And I think for a single number to have that kind of effect over the system of research is vastly disproportionate and kind of worrying. But to, to, to move on from that point and to think about the alt metrics, the way I think about alt metrics is that they are additional dimensions to citation. If you accept citations are no more than a measure of the attention associated with a scholarly output, because that's what they are. They are in a measure of attention given by an output to by, by a set of academics. They have an interesting um, quality in that you have to have been sufficiently interested in the output that you are going to write a paper and mention that paper in your paper. So there's an amount of work involved in making that citation. And I think the issue you probably have with tweeting is that the, uh, the amount of work required is essentially negligible. And I think we would, as, as, as purveyors of all metric information to the sector, we would completely agree with you. Where we think um, alt metrics can be interesting is understanding which pieces of the public are engaging with your work, uh, which segments of society are interested. And we don't want to think of alt metrics just in terms of tweets. We like to think about them in terms of policy documents that are written based on the research. We like to think about them in terms of the patents that come out of the research. And all of that is tied up in the alt metrics that we produce. And so, all too often, alt metrics become synonymous with Twitter, which is a very prevalent data source, but is not the one actually we focus on. So I'd say that I would completely agree. You have to be massively careful with using any kind of alt metrics in benchmarking or evaluation activity. But I think that they have a value in understanding who is consuming your research. I mean, maybe one more response. Sorry, I also don't want to dominate the debate. Just very quickly. It's, I also feel like, I think, as scientists, I think the impact factor may be used by libraries and others, but I think as scientists, there is this genuine feeling that no matter the impact factor, I mean, for instance, I publish in different fields, like communications and mathematical physics is more highly regarded than PRA, though um, PRA has a high impact factor. For us, it's not that number. It's, it's this vague sense of the esteem a journal holds within the community. This is, I mean, and, and that's, that's, that's a problem of the entire community itself, right? I mean, people just say, oh, look, this was published in Nature Physics. And we all know, sure, a lot of crap goes through and uh, being published there doesn't mean at all that this is going to be a good paper, but the likelihood subjectively does seem to increase because some of the editors do seem to uh, get their curation job right, right? So I, I think there's two sides of this metrization. One of them is the scientists themselves and the other side is uh, libraries, funding agencies and policy makers. And I would say, I think scientists don't really decide on this single number or reduce it in such a naive way. I think there is this kind of 
vague and differing sense of a journal quality which doesn't really have to do much with this number itself. If I could just, so I, when I came out of physics, I would have completely agreed with you. Having spent the last 15 years working more across areas, I would say the problem is worse than you think it is. <laughs> uh, just a remark to libraries and impact factors. Normally, we do not use impact factor. So uh, we, pay, uh, we buy in big bundles normally. And then the second uh, reason to buy uh, a journal would be a researcher's wish that we buy the journals. And this is the, the real buying decision we make, not, not concerning to impact factors. I, I do agree that researchers can be more subtle about these issues, but on the other hand, when we are evaluated, unless the funder or the university has really proper policies in place, not just as being signing DORA, which not all have done by any means, but actually implementing that, having that in their rules for peer review and so on, most of the peer review community who evaluates you as a researcher, uh, your grant as a, as a grant evaluator, they will look where you have published. That's a, that's a fact. It's a sad fact, but it is a fact and it's not just the number, the impact factor, but there is a strong correlation between these two. And that's why uh, changing the way we evaluate researchers and science, that, that has to change for plan S to succeed and for this entire open access uh, change revolution to, to work out. Well, I would like to add two things, I think. Um, the first one is about, I agree to everything that has been said about, about the impact factor, but I think there's an additional thing there that there are more and more kind of sub-metrics being kind of introduced there to kind of, again, induce a, sec a different type of competition. So, for example, at, at this university, when we get reports about the department performance, we get, we get how many, the percentage of open access papers and we also get the percentage of Q1 papers, so the top 25% quartiles and the journals that go there. And if you ask me what is the, one of the most toxic metrics that it is this Q1 actually, because it singles out the top 25% and basically says, well, the other 75% are all right, but they're just not as interesting. And you see people kind of pushing into this kind of 25%, which I think is really problematic. And I completely agree to when you go to the life sciences, it's just, for example, where I do a lot of research, there's much more of, of an issue there. And I think um, to kind of there's a lot about the subtle feeling that you mentioned, right, in relation to the, that the communities have. I think what, what would be really important and what I really would like to see more is just that communities spend more time to articulate how that subtle feeling that is quality relates to these impact factors. It might, sometimes it might match, sometimes it might not match. And to kind of articulate that, but then also to voice that in kind of evaluation processes, in institutional procedures, um, to make sure that it also gets heard, because it is very different in different fields. And I think it's very important to do that kind of articulation work, because otherwise, when, when you kind of get away from the kind of circle of scientists who know what have this tacit knowledge, what these journals are about, it will always be produced to these metrics and institutional processes, evaluations, and so on and so forth. Good evening. I came to this topic, I'm a pathologist at the Vienna Biocenter, and I came to this topic on account of my interest in the biomedical research enterprise. And I use the word enterprise not lightly because, you know, it's globally agreed that it's a multi-billion dollar entity at the moment. And I, don't, I would like to bring a few interrelated points, including some of the things that were repeated many times. Uh, to the panel's attention and maybe for future consideration at least. Uh, I hope at least some of you know that in 2015, John Holdren, also a physicist, who was President Obama's science advisor, organized a meeting at the White House uh, to, to discuss American innovation and policy progress and so on. Uh, what's most interesting is at that meeting, a significant portion of the time was spent on discussing the so-called reproducibility crisis, which is now a multi-billion dollar problem. In, and first, the discussion was focused on biomedical research, and then it was found that it extends to all aspects of science. That 
is related to peer review also, because many of these high impact articles were peer reviewed and were later found to be not reproducible. That then raises a question regarding the peer review culture that also brings, in, brings back the question why a library subscription metric suddenly got transformed into a status symbol and then the rush to publish in such high, so-called high-impact journals drives scientists to make errors towards the end of the submission process and subsequently the peer review process sometimes is inefficient and compounds those errors and adds to the immense cost and low return on investment, at least in biomedical research. And now the thought is that it extends to other branches of science as well. That's point one, I hope, I hope to ha have that in your consideration. The second point is, uh, when Professor Lockyer started Nature as a journal and, and got the Macmillan brothers interested in the idea, it also was a community, it was a small scale effort because uh, quantum is supposed to be this community-driven effort and, and scientists are supposed to be interested in it and so on. Uh, then Macmillan Publishing eventually after many decades got acquired by Springer Nature which then was a, or it became Nature Publishing Group and then it became Springer Nature and now it's all acquired by a much bigger multi-billion dollar entity, Whole Spring Publishing. The point I want to make here is that Many small community-driven ideas, good ideas, take off, evolve, and that's when big business starts taking a look at it, at seriously acquiring it. It's a trend that I think has existed for a long time. So when, when we speak of community efforts and how to keep people interested in it and so on, it's also worthwhile to think uh, what, because title of this uh, meeting is Rethinking Academia and the Future of Publishing. So everything had a past and a future and many small things in the past became big business of the future. So that's, that's another point that I'd like the committee to keep, into, keep in consideration. And the other thing is open access and quality and uh, payments were all mentioned. The point of uh, how whether we trust good science and bad science, whether it should all be out there was mentioned. Uh, and I think uh, one point that a very, very good librarian who I consider a campus friend pointed out to me is, A, we shouldn't let all bad science go out. Obviously, it needs to be systematically reviewed. B, but the, is the peer review process proving sufficient at the moment? At least in biomedical research, it's, it seems to be not entirely the case to the extent that The Economist magazine was bold enough to publish an article called, uh, that stated, scientists like to think of science as self-correcting. To a large extent, it's proving to be not the case. Uh, so is peer review proving adequate? Open access, if it has a steady review process at three stages, when the science is being done and after the science is sent out, and if I may use the business term as the science is being consumed by the public, if it has a tertiary review process, I wonder if that would be beneficial. So I, I hope to bring these hopefully interconnected themes to the, to the panel's attention. And I hope you can think of them and comment on them further. Thank you for your time. So, this is, this is related to another question we had prepared, so maybe we, we ask all, all together because otherwise you have to, to, to reply in different steps. So uh, still about peer review, since this, this is partly at, the, partly at the core of the, of the question that was just posed is uh, that the peer review is often considered somehow this system of evaluation of the, of the correctness of, of a research. This is how it, it, it should be, it's supposed to be mostly. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there are even many, many evidence that uh, not all the errors are, are, are uh, actually pointed out by, by this peer review. There have been uh, sociological experiments in, in uh, 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 put, deliberately put some errors in, and, and then sent for peer review and then most of the time this was not the case that they were spotted but mostly just the, the, uh, the style or uh, 
are the minor things considered in, in the, that should be considered in the scientific effort. So as a result, peer review seems today to be something like uh, giving some recommendation or suggestion whether the, uh, an, an article is suitable enough to get into that journal. So what the reviewers most of the time are, are, are saying is not whether this is a scientific correct result, but rather that if this is suitable for the scope of the journal. So peer review is, a, is kind of maybe of, of misunderstood in its original scope. So this connecting the, the, so what is the role of peer review basically and how can we uh, act on peer review now? <laughs> Make the, take the opportunity of being close to the mic. Sorry, no, no, I, I, I feel the same way. I, growing up quite late in the publishing industry, I'm probably youngest among here. I mean, I, I, I always had the feeling that peer review in physics was never really about checking the correctness. Yes, it was a sanity check, say, could these results be correct? But the main questions asked by the journal was, and, and I think those are important questions, if these results are correct or at least plausible, are they interesting? Because I think that, that's what the journal, like, uh, I forgot who had the slides, but uh, the word is uh, this exponential growth of publication output. No sane person could or even an insane person could ever read whatever comes out per day. You need some kind of guidance towards like what should you read and there is like high quality, low quality, good quality but maybe not important for you. So in the end, uh, in physics, most of the peer review in my opinion is really just a sanity check and a kind of putting in slots of importance that can be criticized, that shouldn't be based on impact factors and other things, but in the end, that's what the job of peer review factually is, in my opinion. And I was very surprised when I f first submitted to a mathematics journal and then one year later received a seven-page PDF review of every single equation and uh, suggestions for alternative shorter proofs of the same thing. So I also think that the understanding of what peer review is differs from field to field. And I only know physics and maths, but I'm sure in the life sciences, again, this could be interpreted differently. And what we really need is like a third tier a suggested peer review because at least in physics, I think it's self-correcting. In the end, if you're wrong, it's just going to be embarrassing because a couple of years later, you, people will find out and then you have to write an erratum and then it doesn't really matter if it's in a high impact channel or if it gets retracted, it's just even more embarrassing. Um, so my experience is um, that in theoretical subjects like the one I come from, <clears throat> um, if I'm asked to peer review something, I tend to take quite a lot of care. I go through equation by equation. I don't necessarily reprove it, but I, I make sure that the argument works from equation to equation. And I think in theoretical subjects and the types of papers we receive, uh, you can do that. But if you consider someone in the life sciences who has a wet lab, and who's been funded several million dollars to actually set that experiment up, has managed to acquire certain types of antibodies in order to do a piece of research. This is in, essentially very few people are ever going to reproduce that experiment to actually check it. And so I think as you get into the more um, experimental disciplines, as you get into big science, there's a lower and lower capability to actually check the research. And this is a fundamental problem with the system. In the more theoretical subjects, I think we should expect people to be correct. And then I think there's a, a, a spectrum, a sliding scale. As we become more and more ex heavily experimental, the more people are looking for um, issues in the ethics, issues in the style of the experiment, issues in, in the logical train of thought for why things are being interpreted in the way that they're being interpreted, and much less about actually making sure the experiment itself is rigorous. So I think this is, a, this is certainly my view of, of, of the bits that I've seen. Um, one point of correction to the colleague in the audience, uh, Holt Spring actually only owns a part of Springer Nature. So they originally acquired Macmillan Publishing back in about 1996. And they held Macmillan Publishing and developed it as a company, and when, uh, which owned Nature Publishing Group, you're quite right. But then four years ago, they did a merger with Springer Nature and they own 53% of Springer Nature and 47% is owned by a private equity group called BC Partners. And I know this because Holtzbrink Publishing Group owns Digital Science, my company. 
uh, so for transparency. The uh, interesting thing about Holtzbrink is that actually Holtzbrink across all of its businesses has been one of the publishers which has pushed most strongly for open access. And so although there are individual journals like Nature, which are, I think we can all agree from the discussion today, potentially a bigger part of the problem, Holtzbrink does know that and that they are trying to work out ways to deal with it. So that's the only thing I would say. Um, I'll just give bullet points to be as short as possible. Um, first of all, there is a correction mechanism in science. Granted, it is not perfect, it is not fully effective, however, it exists, which is more than many other fields of human activity can claim. So I don't think uh, uh, we should bash it. Yeah? Don't expect it to work like a, an oracle or anything like that. It is full of problems, but it does exist. So uh, the kind of scientist bashing, I must admit, I, I don't like. Yeah? It, it does work. It really does work. Um, second point um, about refereeing itself. So we want at Cypos to really reform the way people think about refereeing. I dislike the idea that a particular paper has to fit a particular journal's uh, own you know, uh, editorial preferences for certain things. This is not science. This is about journal profiling, which is not interesting for the science. And when it comes to affecting the way you actually write your papers, I think the disease, the cancer, has gone to your bones, and you really got to get rid of it. So about refereeing, one of the problems with refereeing is that um, you're already an overworked, underslept academic, underpaid, uh, no job security whatsoever. And on top of that, you have to reproduce what every single one of your colleagues uh, does around you. You cannot do that. So sometimes you need some accelerators for it. And then indeed, you kind of look at a paper, it looks okay, uh, somebody you trust, verify one or two random equations, they look all right, yeah, fine, go through. Um, <clears throat> Very often your recommendations are not even followed by the editors because then they have other reasons to publish them anyway. So refereeing work is utterly unrewarded, unrewarding, and therefore can be criticized. Yeah? So just change, change the thing, make it much more rewarded. First of all, uh, writing a refereeing report, you have to recognize that it's a lot of work. You have to give credit to it. So it's part of the publishing uh, system. It should be essentially citable. It should be, and therefore it should be visible so it can be reused by other people. Uh, it should be open, and that's what we do. Um, the point also is that there's a moment of refereeing at the moment of publication. I mean, you mentioned the three different uh, things. I think the, uh, uh, the post-publication refereeing is also extremely important. Again, I go back to an example of an experimentalist who's setting up a new, uh, a new optical table somewhere and needs to certify that the thing works properly. So what does this person and his group do? They reproduce known experiments. They get very similar things using the very same uh, uh, fundamental atoms and stuff, but they get slightly different results. Can't get into nature because the other group got there first. So where do they publish that? Nowhere. Okay. So if you actually allow to attach such objects as new forms of publications to the existing corpus, you win across the whole line. And for me, this is part of refereeing. Yeah. So still, I'm even a stronger believer in refereeing after this discussion. So I've never done peer review, but as a consumer of, of science, uh, I like peer review because uh, I wouldn't like to have medical treatment without peer review. Um, but taking into consideration the increasing number of articles, I really would be interested to look behind uh, the peer review system. And I think we have to, to talk and to discuss about maybe introducing new systems or to include new, uh, new systems of peer review, because I cannot believe that all articles are really peer-reviewed seriously. Yeah, peer review fatigue is certainly a real phenomenon and <clears throat> any editor of a journal knows this very well. I, I haven't done much that, of that myself, but I, some of my papers, they take, take longer and longer to find qualified reviewers and sometimes there's a decision based on a single report, even from a very prestigious journal, and then that's basically just an opinion. Um, so, review is very important and it's, it varies field by field and, and it's a very complicated subject. I can just share a couple of anecdotes which are basic, perhaps not something that people consider, is that some people say that very established, prestigious society journals 
for example, by the American Chemical Society. There's been a lot of critique from Plan S, from, from ACS. I've had some of the most uh, precursory surface level reviews in recent years from ACS, very prestigious journals. Obviously, you know, we write very good papers, so there was nothing to criticize there. <laughs> but then on the other hand, from a, from a fully open access, much less prestigious journal, extremely detailed, very technical, very long peer review reports. And so one must not conflate prestige with quality also. It, it can really vary from journal to journal. And on the other hand, I've talked with some colleagues and they've had opposite experiences, so it may vary from paper to paper. And the system does have problems, but it's, it's like democracy. I think it's the best system we got. And if we find ways to uh, improve it, uh, we should do it. Um, Post-publication peer review. I am for open peer review, for publishing the reports openly. Um, I was one of the first people who published my grant review uh, reports for my FVF grant. I published all the peer review reports with the, with the agreement of the uh, reviewers, which was a scary prospect. I published my grant application and the re reviews openly, and I, I don't think they ever got really cited, but at least it's out in the open. Um, so open review is great. Post-publication peer review, I don't see where the motivation is coming from, from, from people to spend a lot of time to do this. I mean, even answering peer review requests from prestigious journals, sometimes you just have to say, no, you don't have the time. Do you really have the time to read papers online just out of your own curiosity and comment on them? Would be great if that were the case, but I'm not so sure how that's going to work. But it's papers you use in your normal research. Right? You, you use the papers and then you notice that there was something wrong. Yeah? But that's after publication decision. That's what post-publication peer review is. It's through usage. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah sure. And, 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 and there are cases like there is a, currently still online on archive, there is a paper that I read first on archive and I was like, no, this is, there's a fundamental misunderstanding. These results are wrong. I then got it to review for a very prestigious journal. I wrote a very detailed report and other reviewers also criticized this paper. Uh, it wasn't accepted, but the archive version is still there. It's still wrong. So uh, having the system somehow be interconnected more and having all this be more transparent and more public, I think would help with reproducibility and, and with these issues and save a lot of time. Yes. No. <laughs> no. Lack of expertise doesn't work. You need the top experts. My yes was yes. It is a silly idea. So no. Oh. Ah. oh. Yes. <laughs> no, but what does work is what you're also working with publons, no, and these kind of things. Many journals do now. I think there are initiatives. It's not by us, but uh, this kind of new platform, Publums, that tries to cross-integrate all different kinds of journals and credit you for the reviews you actually write and tries to double-check this with the journals. So at least at Quantum, we submit all reviewers that want to participate, all their metadata to Publons such that they have a profile that they can then at least say in their CV, okay, ah, this is how many publications I've reviewed for these and these journals, certifiably. The contents of the reviews. It depends on the no, 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 but this was just remuneration. I think remuneration can also, can, remuneration doesn't have to be financial, right? But if you at least get credit for the fact that you are reviewing and if this is part of people's assessment of your CV, this can already go a long way and ensures that still experts in the field and not like empl paid employees that don't actually do any science themselves take care of this review process. So, I, uh, can I... Uh, hello, yeah. So I worked uh, 16 years in text mining industry and also did, I started out as a journalist and then I did library science, computer, computation linguistic. I ended up here at the Technical University in doing patent text mining where everything is open um, except that you can violate the patent of course. But uh, one of the things which every, every time I do search strikes me is that the tools we have to search in is really old school. And 
now in my field of computation linguistic, deep learning is coming everywhere and they love it and they try out all what is on Kegel and sometimes I get to review papers where they don't know the difference between a noun and a, and a verb, which is really silly when you want to do some, some text mining. If you <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I have the experience of insufficient reviewing process, not because the people are not expert, but they're expert in another field. So you actually need a diversity in the reviewers in order to pick out the errors in there or the problem in the paper at least. Uh, so what we are doing now at the technical library is actually to not only do the Google keyword search, but actually you can mark text and then we retrieve the relevant papers and the paragraphs that are relevant for your start citation using deep learning. So I don't, I'm not, I like the emerging technology, but it should be used in a way that it actually con contribute and not get confused by, about noun, nouns and verbs, um, which is generally the case. Um, <clears throat> So here is where I want to point it out. It's like you can have how much data you want out there. If you can't find it, because we have very old school search technology for the information science need, <coughs> then we will still not get further. So we need tools for the reviewing process, making it quicker, smarter, and supporting us. At the same time, we need tools for the information need of a scientist. I developed that for patent exa examiners, and it took me 10 years to get that right. But at least start there to actually have tools that can find, detect fake news, fake science, actually browse it because we have the technology, we have the data, it's just a question of the effort getting there. So there are some interesting statistics around this. Last year about 4.8 million articles were given DOIs by Crossref. In the year before I think it was about 4.2 million. So the number, or maybe 4.5 million, but in any case the number is going up precipitously. A lot of the new work that's coming out is actually coming out of China. China is now the second largest producer of academic work in the world. And uh, the structures we have for identifying peer reviewers, I completely agree, are not optimal. So in fact, a lot of the peer review burden is going on to the old research economies in Europe, in the US, the established research economies. And so actually the volume of papers is going up significantly, but the people we're asking to peer review is exactly the same group as it was before. And we haven't yet got the peer review networks that we need in China in order to actually spread the work evenly. So there is a disparity in workload. There's a barrier to actually finding the right people to peer review as well, in that the data that's contained within the articles is typically not available for text mining. So in creating our product dimensions, one of the things that we actually had to do with a large number of publishers is go publisher by publisher and sign text and data mining agreements with them so that we could mine the full text of the, of the work. And in fact, most search mechanisms don't allow you to search full text. Our product does, but it does because of this vast amount of work going publisher by publisher and actually getting the right to do so. And that was not trivial to do. So I think that while the technology exists, the legal situation is not helpful. And in fact, the discussion we've been having today about going open access, open access actually completely changes that space. And I think that's, that's an, another excellent reason that none of us have highlighted why open access is great, because actually it, it fuels the tools that we're going to need. Yeah, that's that's really one of the main reasons why CCBY is the default license in in, in Plan S. Um, even even some of the let's say least restrictive alternatives like ND non non derivatives that might prevent text and data mining, and and it really is the license is something that is, is a complicated issue, and there are some valid concerns. For example, when we were writing our statement, some humanities scholars were worried that their words could be taken out of context uh, 
uh, if it was just CCBY and no derivatives would be would would not be disallowed. Um, but but the text and data mining is something that there should be, and, and Plan S is is kind of a band-aid on this. We should have a EU-wide copyright law that will allows text and data mining of all publicly funded research. Barring that and getting all of the member states to agree on that, well, at least we'll have something uh, for a large part of the uh, of the research literature. Uh, just on the legal front, actually, the biggest threat to all of that comes also from the EU with Articles 11 and 13 of the new uh, GDPR regulations. Um, there are essentially uh, new laws that are being put forward at the European level about essentially uh, that, that are affecting the kind of reuse part of the, uh, 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 you know, machine mind uh, stuff. And these regulations are uh, not yet adopted by, adopted by the countries, but if they are adopted, uh, they could have a very detrimental effect on all this thing. Yeah, so, but this is a big unknown, actually. But uh, recent developments are really uh, quite worrying. So uh, I've got two questions. Uh, first is like, um, we have a good tool to publish, but not peer review. It's called archive in physics. And the the main problem with archive is, uh, as I understood it, like we can't peer, uh, we can't do we, we we don't have a peer review re process at all. But um, if we look to the open source community, they have a, like something like a peer review pre a process. It's called issue tracking. And uh, if we look at if we're doing the same experiments but get slightly different data, there is a tool in um, the open source community too. It's called um, feature request. So, and we have a software who does that, it's called GitHub or GitLab. So, why not merging archive and GitHub for science? So, and it's really high profitable because Microsoft just bought GitHub. There, there is money in GitHub, so <laughs> it, it's no problem. And the second thing is for, for your peer reviewing, like issue tracking is uh, some volunteer thing. You, you write a bug report and it's, it's tracked and it's tracked if it's solved or if it's not solved. And everybody's doing that uh, like for free because it's, if you work in, in the computer science or in the IT departments, it's part of your job description to write those bug reports. And shouldn't it be part of a researcher's or scientific research uh, job descriptions to do the referees, just like at the university you are forced to do teaching. Maybe just a very brief response. To, I, I think these ideas exist and exactly the comparison to GitHub, there is this group of people, for instance, in my field, they founded Cyrate and then it died down and they launched it again, which in the end, I mean, it, it's, it's not as ambitious, not with issue trackings, not with feature requests, pull requests, or any of these things. Just the ability to comment on archive articles and to discuss them. The problem is that too small a part of the community have adopted using it and the functionality is not very transparent and you have this kind of like thing which is completely odd. And so, so somehow I, I, I feel like for a wide adoption, this would have to go to the archive um, itself to be accepted. So these facilities you're talking about essentially exist at the level of uh, commenting. So uh, they, they've existed for many, many years. Uh, we at SciPost also have an infrastructure for commenting, so for doing essentially what you're talking about, but not quite the same way as the issue tracking with the software, but factually it's the same thing. If you observe the uh, uh, adoption of this, you will find that it's just not adopted. Yeah, uh, academics don't use it. You can say, okay, academics, uh, they don't know anything about GitHub. They've never done a summer internship in uh, you know, software development, so they just need to be exposed to it. That's not true, actually. Many of them do uh, know about it. They're just not motivated to do that. And you could motivate them by mandating it, uh, essentially putting it into their job description, like you said, giving, giving metrics for this. Uh, so, so, you know, I think it's a great idea in principle. However, yeah, uh, uh, to change the community's habits is so much more difficult than you can even begin to fathom. And believe me, I speak from experience. 
uh, I've, uh, uh, I, I admit I've used uh, charm, threat, intimidation to get movement in there, and I'm coming from inside without any interest in there, and still the movement is not happening anywhere near I want. So, um, what can I say? Yeah? Maybe my only hope is that time will do its thing. Peer reviewing actually is part of our job description. It's not written in our contracts, but it is an accepted community standard. You were talking about community standards and, 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 and those things, and that, that it really is. We don't actually, like we put journals we review for into our CVs, which actually nobody checks still. I mean, you could write in principle anything there. Publons is a good way to make this a bit more, um, yeah, exact. Um, but we do, I think it's more coming from the fact that our papers get reviewed and we, we know that there is good reviewing and there's bad reviewing. If there is a paper in our community where there are some flaws, we want to be there to say that, hey, please correct this and, and this is not correct and, and so on. Um, it is part of our job. We just are not compensated for it and or even rewarded it for it, actually. I think that's a very, very interesting point. I'm always, when, when you know, this, there's this argument about the compensation for reviews, I'm always a bit torn between two things because on the one hand, of course, it's completely correct that this part is undervalued. What it, what is, what is, it's very important for the scientific enterprise and it's not worth enough put on it in the kind of metrics. But on the other hand, I'm asking myself, well, if we now take every part of the job description of a scientist and start to metricize it, what do we end up with at the end of the day in the sense of, you know, um, isn't this then also generating a lot of stress on the individuals? And we think we have very good psychological studies from very metricized environments like the UK that this can be very difficult, right? So the question is, um, so I'm always very torn, right? Is this a good thing? Because on the one hand, of course, you want to give this credit, but on the other hand, it's also one further step into the metricization of virtually everything, which I think can also be very problematic. Hi. Hello. So, Certainly the open accessibility seems to be an important milestone, but I'm somewhat pessimistic that it will really improve the overall atmosphere in academia that we right now experience. And this maybe could be illustrated by the mere fact that when you compare, and I guess many of people share this experience, when you compare the list of publications, of your own publications that are mostly cited, or attractive media coverage on one hand, and the list of publications that you're really proud of, that you really think that they push the frontier of science. Um, on the other hand, at least in my case, these two sets are mo almost disjoint. And so I wonder what is the cause of that, and I, I guess there are many of them, but it seems to me that the most severe one is, is the following. As long as the biggest publisher are profit-based organization, prof, then by the mere nature of such organization is to get more profit. And that's what we are experiencing now. Many of the things, the science will, is becoming a hype in some cases. And I don't want to generalize this. The science will be reshaped. We hear how many hours of our people and ourselves are invested just to reshape the paper in a form that it is accessible for high impact journals. And that of course has a also back reaction because in, I was sitting in many committees in which people were counting how many high impact journals you have. And it was a very important uh, uh, measure for the decision. And so we employ people who actually play this game very well. Okay, so the, what I would like to ask is, is there, I mean, I'm sure that these big publishers will swallow this, will become of open access. And, but, but the way how they will shape further our science will remain the same. And this is related by my nature that they are profit based. So the question is, can we bring back, at least partially, publishing to the public domain or to the 
community-based. And I'm not asking here for universal uh, measure application. I just that the biggest publishers are actually returned to the public domain. That's, those are all very valid concerns and there's certainly in the open access advocacy community there are mixed feelings about the current transition and, and the fear that the big publishers will own it, own the new system as well. And that is a real fear. But there are two important points that might help change the system. One is evaluation. If we change how we evaluate each other, actually, you know, we are responsible for evaluating each other, each other's grants, each other tenure ac applications, each other's papers. If we change that, then, then we, we can have some real change in the system. And, and then the, the prestige of a specific journal is no longer as important as the actual contents of the paper. How to get there, that's going to be difficult, but it's a, good, it's a worthwhile goal. Um, the other point that the transition to open access and, and, and even article processing fees, even though they, they do have some problems, I agree with some of the members of the panel on that. Currently, when you have these huge big deal bundles, there is, there is no market. There is no market whatsoever. Your libraries have to subscribe to this bundle and that bundle and the third bundle, and that's it. There is no real market in effect. Even if we move just to an all, all APC system, then I think there would be more power for uh, newer initiatives and other journals to, to compete in this marketplace, apart from the big publishers. But that's a big if. I mean, just to add to this perspective, I think indeed we're, we're almost a bit shy talking about these things, talking only about open access, because one of the big issues for me really is for-profit versus not-for-profit, community-organized versus kind of profit-driven, creating the hype and so on. And one obvious solution that people don't like to talk about is, of course, a, it's not even a renationalization, it's a deprivatization of publishing, right? These are publicly funded universities, researchers and so on, and one could just mandate instead of open access, like Plan Estos, one could mandate not-for-profit. And that would be a big step further, but I guess this is harder to advocate, not really sure why. I'm guessing maybe a lot of influential scientists sit in editorial boards for for-profit publishers, I don't know. However, um, and, and that's the thing, right? How do we get there then, right? How do we even start moving in the right direction? And this is something of, like, the, the reason why we have this kind of community grassroots journals, but at the same time still focus on more traditional impact metrics to then become one of these career-making journals in the hopes that this could then just be replaced from within. Very quick comment on the profit versus non-profit non issue, I mean, on society versus commercial publishers. American Chemical Society is one of the most regressive publishers regarding open access. Uh, their executives make $700,000, $800,000, maybe more than a million per year. And this is perceived by the community to be a community society and community journals. We have to be we have to be nuanced about these issues. There's not uh, open is good and closed is bad. Society is good and commercial is bad. It's not that simple. Yeah, just just to add something to this the, is um, so. First of all, whether I would ask, I would like to ask whether it is sustainable to bring this non for non for profit publishing to 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 a larger scale, so to to actually replace what we have now, because it seems it seems that the the whole scientific enterprise is something that is mostly publicly funded from, from the getting the ideas to the basic research uh, all the way down to, to so everything that happens in the universities, the, 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 the production of knowledge is mostly public, publicly funded except for a step in between which is uh, for in, made by for-profit companies, which sounds at, 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 at least weird, right? And so the, the, um, the example I want, to, I want to make, for instance, is what, what prevents the distribution of knowledge, so the whole publishing system, to be managed directly from a consortium of universities, for instance, or at the public, in general, at the public level, from, so nationalized or in, in even bigger at the European level, or 
uh, as, as exactly in the same way as big grants are, are, are managed, for instance. So the, the distribution of money for education and for research is managed at the public level in the vast majority. Why cannot be the publishing system managed in the very same way? So this is a really interesting point. Um, I think if you think about uh, any kind of system of, uh, of trust, I was talking a little bit about trust earlier, I think you need an external third party as part of the trust system. And so I think asking academia to moderate itself, given that it's being given government funding, is a challenging proposition. I think asking uh, granting bodies to moderate themselves is also a, chal is a challenging proposition. So I think what publishers have always been is kind of that external third eye that's seen as part of research in a certain sense, but also separate from research. So I think that there's a, I think there is a, a role that they can play. I don't th I'm not sure how you maintain the trust if you are uh, just mm, uh, moderating the system from inside. Uh, I'll have a diametrically opposite viewpoint. Uh, uh, to me, to me, it's a question of uh, polluting the thing with uh, considerations that go beyond the academic considerations. If I think of trust, uh, what do I trust? Well, I actually trust uh, the archive. <laughs> Why? Uh, uh, it's a monopoly. It's kind of a dominant thing. There's no like uh, competition to get it right. And how could it be so good? Because there's no alternative model and things. We're all stuck with it. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, the archive is not making profits. It's essentially a para uh, academic organization that was started from inside. That is essentially very good at identifying the one thing it wants to do well, which is serve preprints. It's very good at limiting its mission to do just that. It's very good at essentially not letting itself be influenced by anything, you know, uh, uh, that deters it to its mission. It's not, it's really not trying to do anything there. So that's where my trust is. And if essentially uh, external organizations with then uh, uh, other motivations get mixed into this, it, it, it just doesn't work. And there's no such thing as academia as a, a core. I, I mean, I'm sure it's your experience as well. I've never seen so many people unable to agree with each other and debating all the time as a bunch of academics together on conference. And that's the whole point. Uh, so, I mean, I think for me, it's entirely possible to run the thing without this external pollution uh, in the system. And uh, about essentially the, the, the not-for-profit nature that you were mentioning and the kind of community-driven thing, this is, this is exactly the vision that, uh, uh, that you know, I'm trying to do with SciPost and that uh, people uh, are trying to, to share on this. I do believe that this is possible. Once again, I repeat a point that I've uh, already made. I don't think the technical challenges are beyond what we normally do as academics. We do much more complicated stuff. Yeah? This is not rocket science. We can do it. I think it's a question of changing the habits, of installing the system, and just moving this whole edifice to something else. It takes a long time to turn uh, you know, an ocean liner direction. And I think turning academia is even tougher. But it can happen. Yeah? I just want to make a very down-to-earth comment. So if we speak about big profit of 40%, we speak about Elsevier. Uh, I know no other publisher that has this profit margin. And as we have to tender all our agreements, I see into the books of publishers. And believe me, already middle class publishers or middle small publishers have real problems to survive. So uh, I think we, we have a little bit to, to concentrate on or to come away from always seeing Elsevier as the one publisher. It is important, it is dangerous, but it's the only publisher with 40% uh, profit margin. Very direct answer to your, to your question. What is standing in the way of, of changing the system and making it public and so on? It's prestige and it's us. It's the way we evaluate each other, that's the problem. And, and changing that, if that could be done, the whole system could be changed overnight. But we are locked in a prestige economy, 
And that is the core problem. And how do we change that is a much more difficult question than, than having 100% open access to all publications. That's, that can be solved and that will be solved, as some said. It will be happen, the big publishers will buy it, that, that will change in the next few years. But how do we change the whole system of evaluation? And I, that's the real difficult question. Um, I, I think I, I, I need to disagree with the, the observation that it's just the publishing thing that is the commercial thing. Um, I do think that we, that we are seeing more and more bits and pieces of research work being commercialized in different ways, right? So they have the first companies in, in certain fields that offer to, for profit, write research grants for researchers. There are certain areas of research that where it's even possible to outsource data production to specific companies. So there are a lot of different offers that, that are there, but I think the crucial thing about the, the, the publication is that I see a lot of those other offers are actually using the, the publication business as a platform to offer their services. So when you kind of publish with one of the large publishers, very often you get an offer to do language editing. There are services to provide video abstracts for you. There are services to kind of have a better accessibility of your paper from different, in different ways. So there's actually an entire industry that is kind of starting to develop. So I think it's really interesting and important to ask which aspects of the work that we are doing as researchers are being kind of monitorized and where we are being offered specific services to increase our competitiveness indeed. And what that means for academia as an entire enterprise. And I think that also includes, for example, monetary incentives on top level publications or on bringing in top level grants that are becoming more and more common at certain institutions. So I think there's a monetarization of the entire system that is not, I mean, not to defend the publishers, but I think it's not limited to the publishers alone. And I think if we talk about that, we need to talk about the entire just to comment on that one of the main fears of some of open of the most vocal open access advocates is the lock-in of not just the publishing system but research evaluation systems we are using pure from Elsevier at, at our university where we put all of our research outputs and, and metrics and blah 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 and if the, the fear is that, that open access will become irrelevant if, if the entire research evaluation metrics, metadata, everything like this is locked into one system, like SAP for accounting, then it doesn't matter if it's open access or not. And, and I, I don't know personally enough about that aspect of the problem, but I think it is a, is a real fear. So a little bit earlier, I gave you a kind of a vision for where things could go with publishing with these kind of research objects and this different approach. And I completely agree with everyone on the panel that if you want to change the system and you want to move away from the esteem economy that we live in, then things like that shift may be a route to do it. But the culture change is not going to happen quickly. Actually getting people uh, weaned off the, the, the nature article, the cell article, the, the science article for their academic progression is remarkably challenging because it's, it's built into our system at almost every level. Um, so whether you're going for a grant, whether you're going for a tenured position, whether you're going for a postdoctoral job, your people are always looking at where you've published rather than what you've published. And so this is fundamentally a, a shift which I think will probably take 15 years to, uh, to happen. Hello. Um, I would like to first ask Marcus uh, about your journal because you said uh, it already has a high impact factor. I would like to hear a few words about the story behind it, like how did it lift off and so on. And also I just wondered, um, what about the citations in those articles that are published in your journal? Are they also mostly open access or not? And because that got me thinking, actually, when the panel first started, my first question was going to be, uh, how do you choose where to publish? But this question was already asked. And then the second thing would be, how do you choose what to cite? Um, because, uh, of course, in an ideal world, you, you would like to go over and cite every single article relevant to your research, but now we know that this is uh, physically impossible, so actually you are making a choice. And uh, then I started thinking of some extremes, like for example, if I write a, a paper citing only open access articles, would I be able to publish it in a uh, paywall subscription journal, or on, on the opposite extreme, would you publish an article who doesn't cite any open access journal um, articles? 
So I just started thinking, is there something in this area that the researcher could do to promote open access publication without jeopardizing the quality of the research? It, it, is, it, could that be something uh, to think about? Or would it also lead to some kind of segregation, so to say, in the future? Like a world of open access publication and another world of non-open access? I mean, just your opinions. So since you addressed me, I'll give a very brief response. So first of all, a technical issue. So for quantum, because you asked, there is no rule whatsoever on what you're allowed to cite. And from personal experience, and that's the whole reason why I find publication metrics only interesting on average, but certainly not per article, because we all know, like, we don't only cite the stuff we use. We contextualize our research, and for that, we basically have absolute free choice of whatever we want, right? People cite in their introductions. I mean, that's another thing, right? We cite nature papers because they kind of show it's an important field or there are some important results there. I mean, I mean, well, it, I, I'm myself guilty of this. I, and I'm sure most of us are or have been at some point in their career. I don't know. Um, so, so the point is, here, I feel like, just as a side remark, one could even, to some extent, say the number of citations of your article should be checked against the impact factor. And uh, to have a good publication, you don't only need to be in a high impact journal, but your article needs to gain more citations than average. Then maybe people think twice about sending stuff there and overselling it massively, but it's another issue. But no, technically, we have no limitations whatsoever on uh, the types of sources you're allowed to cite, the number of citations you're allowed to include. Technically, if you want, you could include 500 citations. There is nothing to buy you from this. And all the citations are easily extractable in metadata format on our website, just as open access and CC by 4 as the articles are. And I think the reason we got an unexpectedly high impact factor, I'm not going to say it here because it's not even officially out yet. So it's just a self-computed one. And I think the reason is that we're not an established journal, we're not a good venue, we're not a place where people send their articles because they think it's good for their careers. Uh, we're a venue where people send uh, their articles for political support of an idea of transformation and publishing, and those people are coincidentally usually very established, people that already have kind of big groups or very influential articles and they're often cited anyway. And I think this is why all of our initial submissions are highly cited. And I think this might actually go down again. But again, I, I, we don't really care so much about it. So I'm not even, we even wanted to avoid making our impact factor public if possible. Very, very quickly. Um, for, for plan as compliance, your, your, your citation metadata should be CC0 actually and not just CCBY. So you might want to consider that. Yeah, and, and then one, one, one direct response, it would be actually research misconduct to only choose to cite open access. We have to cite the relevant literature, whether it's open or, or closed. We cannot distinguish based on that. It would be unethical. Uh, hello. Um, I wanted to bring, uh, bring back a topic that I've seen come up a few times here. So, I mean, starting with in one of the, the earlier talks where we talked about you know, the PDFs being a bit outdated and, you know, new formats of displaying data and actually publishing. Um, and then it came up, I think, again, when we talked about there's the ability to do your uh, comments post-publication and that people aren't doing that because it's not uh, fitting the, the habits of scientists and stuff. And I was, I was wondering, because there's, I mean, there's a lot of people there coming up with new tools uh, in this discussion, but these are all tools on, for example, a single journal, and they'll be on their own websites and these sort of things. And so it becomes, I think, very difficult to use that because you're going to have to be going onto a new place every time. Whereas if I think of the way I'm reading papers now, I'm downloading a bunch of PDFs, usually far more than I'm actually reading, and then I'll put them into Mendeley, which I started using before Elsevier bought it. Um, and then I will eventually get around to reading these PDFs because it's one system that's able to manage it. So when you're coming up with these new ideas on different ways of publishing, is there thought of having like a sort of standardized API that you can 
communicate with all the journals so you can have a, a reference manager that can always give you the most up-to-date version? Or is it going to be that you will have to, to, to m maybe make your references in a paper? You're going to have to go from site to site every time you're using a different uh, location. So there are industry-wide standards for a lot of this kind of work. So uh, Crossref, the people who give most of the DOIs out, have a technology called Crossmark, which ensures that you're always referencing and guided to the most recent version of the article. We do a lot of the work with the tools that we create to make sure that they are um, available to whichever publishers and that they all have uh, open APIs so you can extract data from them, whomever you are. And so there's a, there is a lot of thought that goes into, into this kind of area. Um, we specifically are not part of a publisher so that we can work with all publishers. Uh, that's one of the things that's kind of in our foundation. In, and it's in order to ensure that we can keep a APIs open. And as we gain scale in the market, we are large enough that publishers trust us, they want to work with us, and we can get them to uh, agree to and adhere to a standard. Because if you're very small and you have just a few set of tools or they're just on one journal, it's very difficult to ask a publisher to uh, put resource into working with your standard. Whereas if you're larger in the market, you have lots of publishers working with you, asking them to work with a, with a standardised approach actually is, is something that, uh, that you can do in the market. Um, I mean, all of the digital science companies come out of academic institutions. They are small companies that are created by academics who have come out of academia, they've had a good idea, they've solved a problem, and they work with us to actually make their pro give their problem their solution scale. And so, in, in some sense, we're almost the solution to your question. We, we, we spend our time actually addressing this very actively. You're in a good place to collaborate directly with publishers, but, but having open access and liberal licenses will open the marketplace to many more actors without your connections, and I think you're also for that, of course. Um, hi, here. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I really enjoyed this event, and it's really nice to hear like so many intelligent, experienced people talking about this. And, but at the same time, I want to share, share some uneasiness that I have, and the fact is that we were organizing a similar event at the Vienna Bio Center, and while we were trying to invite people, so I, we, um, I got this reply from Bjorn Brems from the University in Würzburg, who's really involved in open access, you might uh, know him, so saying that he would not come because this was, um, he is tired of attending events like this and he thinks that they are not useful. And actually in, uh, he uh, said, if you can put a video of um, my opinion and stream it on the event and he linked me to an article he wrote arguing why he's not attending such events. And I wasn't, I mean, I was a bit pissed to say when I read it, but it kind of made sense. So my question is like, um, although I enjoyed really this event when I'll go out and I think it fosters discussion and everything, um, how, how useful, not, not, I don't want to question so much how useful these events are, but what can we really do and we are progressing, right? And this brings me to, like a reflection, I think I, I read that on Twitter, someone was saying I told uh, my partner about the publishing, uh, so a scientist to um, their partner about the publishing method and um, he said, I thought your scientists were the smart people, right? And we listed here like so many flaws our system has and um, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not uh, very optimistic uh, like uh, you, um, Jean Sebastian said, if if we we're, if we won't do it, if we want to do it, we will do it about open access. So I, I don't know if if it's so easy. Sometimes I, I really like think we're we're in a crisis in science. Like I'm, I'm I'm a young scientist. Quite often when I'm like reading a paper, I'm like, what what are they trying to sell me here? I'm very skeptical of what I what I read. I, I wonder about the public. And I mean, I don't know, you, your journal clubs, our journal clubs, we, we trash so much, the, most of the papers we, re, we read, which are like peer reviewed. So going to the, how many flaws our system has, and with the idea that um, if there are more scientists now than ever have been probably, 
you, we, you are so smart and so, so how, how come the, like, the whole thing has so many flows? And, and maybe we're not so smart or I don't know. And I want to bring a, like a, a small criticism in here. This discussion has been mainly um, between uh, white men. So maybe we're not engaging everyone in here. As a reflection. To be fair to Björn, um, he's one of the most visible commenters on this, so he probably gets way more invites he can he can answer. So, yeah, yeah. so it's not personal. Just you know, one one comment on on we are more scientists than ever. That is true, um, and they are smart, um, but they are also competitive people. And one structural thing is that even though they are more than ever, less than ever are on any kind of tenured position or position with a kind of future perspective. Um, and that, of course, fuels enormous competitive dynamics uh, in the system that makes it a lot of the, solving a lot of these problems much harder than it would be otherwise. I guess. Maybe just the last statement, because on the diversity, I was also feeling a bit uncomfortable about this whole thing. But I think it's 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 also a sad reflection of the state of physics itself. Maybe not so much among the young generation, but physics still has a huge problem in being biased towards. Uh, I'm going to subsume as white men. I mean, this is a sad state of affairs, and I think it is also strongly connected to the way academic careers are made and um, many structural problems that have to be addressed that we didn't talk about, we didn't touch upon, and I couldn't possibly even address in a short comment. I also reprise an organizer of the Mostly White Men <laughs> event. That No, it's something that is not the first event they organize. Two, of the organi two out of three of the organizers are, are women here, by the way. <laughs> uh, no, the, the point is that uh, we always try, of course, to this this part of diversity, but I don't take this as my own personal responsibility. Of course, I try to do the most, but I don't choose people because there are women giving a priority to this in the sense of uh, inviting them for a couple of hours to give their opinion. I, I give this back to the professors who have to hire them, who have to give the opportunity to stay in academia and then to have the possibility to speak in the position where they're, they should be invited. So I, I really think that, of course, it's an important issue to, to think about diversity, but we should not uh, focus on the, on the single event of a half of, of an afternoon criticizing the organizers for this. This is something I always, it's true. Is, is something I, I, I always reject as a criticism to my events because is a, I try to hire the people who are, who are in the position for and have the visibility for telling me that they have the competence for being sitting here in such panels. Um, I just wanted to have a comment um, because uh, I think we all here sitting uh, till the quite late evening because we are enthusiastic. We want to push science forward. I think every scientist is an enthusiastic person, wants to do things voluntarily, wants to uh, improve the science and the society. But at the, at the other hand, we are kind of in a schizophrenia or also alibistic at some points because you are or we are all working in a framework where if you submit a grant everyone is looking at uh, your publication records uh, including the ERC. Um, we also um, if, if you apply for a position, if you want to keep your position, if you go, want to get uh, higher in your positions, everyone is looking at your um, publication records, and especially if they are in good journals, if they are in high-profile journals, if they are in Web of Science listed, or if they are listed in Scopus. Uh, so I think we are addressing, we are talking to each other, and we all know this is good, uh, a good way, and then an important way to go, but we also have to address those who create these frameworks 
uh, based on which you are evaluated because if we keep evaluate ourselves or our scientists based on whether their publications are in these or those um, I don't know databases or they are they have these or that impact factor or they have the uh, quartile one or two then uh, we can be as enthusiastic as we want to but we will not achieve the same thing because we will all always be pushed to this uh, alibistic thing that we all know that this is not the right way to go but we have to do it in the end well so uh, as far as i'm concerned i think it's a question of uh, infrastructure if you have the tools at your disposal and they're objectively better you will use them but if you don't have the tools, you can organize as many conferences on these things as you want, and still you don't have them. So I think we have to, in a sense, uh, keep on talking. Yes, that's great, but you also have to build stuff. And this goes uh, very often outside of your work hours. But I mean, I think there is movement for these things now, and I hope you, you recognize it. And from, from my end, I think, once again, I repeat, um, if, and that's also uh, getting back to your comment, I mean, I'm, I'm still enthusiastic about it, maybe I'm stupid. Uh, uh, so despite the, uh, the completely uh, glacial nature of academia in general uh, for change and for reform, uh, I do think that hammering the uh, objective points onto people's heads and providing replacement infrastructure to deprecate the existing failed one is the way to go. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Hi, I, uh, I wanted to make a comment on what you said before. My name is Katharina Rick. I'm the FWF Open Science Manager. So you asked the question, um, what can we really do as scientists, as researchers? So I would say support open access by publishing in open access journals, by not being an editor for journals that are not open access support Plan S, because with Plan S, we as research funders really want to try to change the system. Um, just a comment to the reward system, for instance, we, we want to try and push um, the DORA declaration with Plan S even more. At FWF, for instance, we've signed the DORA declaration in 2013, um, and we didn't only sign it, but what does it mean? Um, when, whenever we ask for reviews, we um, we don't uh, accept reviews that are only based on the impact factor, for instance. And I think these are practices that really need to go, need to be executed by other institutions as well, so that we can actually have not only uh, impact-based um, reviews. Um, that's, that's the one thing. Another thing, just in general, about Plan S. Um, I also support um, what Jean uh, Sebastian just said about um, alternative infrastructures. We at FWF, we support various other infrastructures, not only the big publishers. So we have the transformative agreements in place with the uh, Austrian Academic Library Consortia. But what we try is to really shape a, div a diverse um, ecosystem of open access. And that's why we are supporting SitePost or Open Library of Humanities. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and so we think with Plan S, we can put this on a different level. We do it on a national level and we have been quite successful already. So 93% of all our publications resulting from FWF projects are open access, openly available. So what we do want to do now with Plan S is just put it on a next level, on a global level, on an international level. Um, can I also add something to your comment? Um, I've also been organizing a few events so far, and, and I have tried to have, you know, like uh, gender balance, uh, um, invited speakers, or not only white male speakers. But what I've noticed is that many times there are a lot of uh, women professors that are really overwhelmed with, with invitations, and in the end they are not able just to accept all of them. Many times they turn them to their male postdocs, for example, and what do you do? Then you're uninvited because the, you change the gender of what the person we wanted to invite. So should you downgrade the quality of the conference you want to organize in order to, for to may, maybe some very early stage researchers, in order to uh, check that you have a very balanced situation from many point of view? Um, I, I think that in the end, the, the issue is not 
it's not that easy to solve. I personally did not find a, a, an answer that satisfies me. And I don't think that just looking at the conference and say, okay, this was not 50-50 is a good metric because you really don't know, for example, whether they've tried to invite people and why they did some certain decisions. And, and I personally have had found a lot of problems many times to try to actually balance the gender of speakers and so on. And I really think that this is an entire issue on its own. And yes. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I wanted to comment on your well. comments. I th I'm also one of the organizers, and I think that what Julia and Flavio wanted to say, so I'm reinterpreting your words, all right, <laughs> is that this crowd is not diverse, and this discussion is not diverse, and this panel is not diverse. It's, it's, you're right. As academia is not diverse. So this, unfortunately, reflects where we are in general, and especially where we are in this building, especially where we are in physics, and this is an, another topic, difficult topic on its own, and that's why we also were thinking to uh, make this event, Rethinking Academia, a series of events, if we manage, and one of these could be actually diversity in academia, because it's also something else we need to rethink about academia, in my opinion. So maybe as a speaker, I mean, I, I say the, the gender issue is, is really fantastic, super important and things. I, I think it's a bit unfortunate for the organizers that it uh, kind of like that. So I want to like express the things. I know you've made efforts for this and you work just like me in an environment where essentially all the dice are uh, you know, uh, pipped against you. So it's, uh, it's very, very difficult, yeah. Uh, that said, I think organizations can take a very proactive role for this. So, you know, professional societies should be much more militant about uh, gender diversification and things like that. Um, uh, at uh, at SciPost, what we're trying to do is really completely skew the percentages. So we, uh, uh, we are trying to skew the percentage of, uh, 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 of women in our editorial college at the moment. And the objective I had of in mind is to have it about three times uh, uh, more than the current percentage. So, so the kind of rule would be ideal world 50-50. And uh, uh, until now, we're looking at the uh, kind of percentage of uh, women uh, in, in the field. And we say triple that temporarily for decisional powers within, uh, within SciPost, within the publishing system. That can only help and things like that. But I think organizations really take, should take a much more proactive role on, uh, on this. So uh, different issues than open access, of course. Uh, one comment, please. I'm, I'm moving away from the uh, sociological remarks back to the main point that was discussed, uh, you know, about we had the discussion, it's very nice. I commend all of you for all the effort and I learned a lot by just being here. But again, uh, Ron Vale, a San Francisco biologist who uh, wrote a very elegant article in PNAS about accelerating publishing in scientific uh, realms. Uh, in, his, in his article he writes, as is often the case, it is easy to articulate the problem than to derive solutions. And I think one of the points that my VPC colleague made, and probably I'm over-interpreting, but his pessimism or his caution is that there are many more discussions than there are solutions. And so I'd like to ask the committee, the panel, a candid question. Open access, peer review, publishing. Uh, in your assessment, are these partially a policy problem? Are these partially an enterprise management problem? Is this entirely a university problem that should be handled within universities, etc.? And the reason I ask is, there's also a, a concept of levels. When the Secretary of Health and Human Services, after Congress votes on funding, talks to nature and says, what we fund has to be open access, it became open access. Some articles, funded by NIH, which, is, which I think is one of the biggest funding bodies in the world, is they, they do it. So how do we, would you please comment and then maybe educate us on what you think, your perspective on levels at which uh, these topics should be approached and how much should policy be involved? Thank you. Every level, that's my answer, every level.
The question is, that makes the entire problem even more tricky, I think, is, is what kind of policy are we thinking about, right? Because I think a lot of the things that have been discussed here as open access policy um, actually are in quite some tension with things that are being done as higher education policy. And uh, those need to be articulated in relation to each other because we can't on the one hand say, okay, everything should be open access. And it's, as some of, you know, a lot of people have said it's quite easy to agree to that. But what are the consequences to that then for the way that we build universities? We have, you know, all the things that we've been talking about today partially tie into university rankings, tie into kind of a lot of different other systems that policymakers actually do care, care quite, a bit, quite a bit about. So in that sense, I think it's also about articulating these things in relation to each other. And, and I think that's, that's actually because there has been the mention that there are a lot of events around open access. I think that's, you know, potentially one, one thing that I, that I can see in this event and why it's trying to articulate that in, in specific ways is kind of asking this also as a broader question, not just kind of what are the technicalities of kind of getting open access to be successful, which clearly is important, but how does it relate to kind of other aspects and how do we bring these aspects together so not to kind of, you know, have one policy cancel out the other, so to say. Um, yeah, I wanted to say I, I would not like that someone like goes home and then is like, I went to an event about rethinking academia and we ended up talking about uh, gender and diversity. I think it's really good that we that we talked about this. And my point was that these things are linked, right? So if we want to rethink academia, we should also talk about gender and diversity. And my, I, I was not, not at all attacking the the, the organizers, or uh, and and my point was like I think the audience was more diverse than the people that took the um, that participated in the discussion, and this was um, uh, what I wanted to say. And yeah. That's it. So last question here. Okay, so it was half a comment, half a question. So in regard to what Lisa said before, the, the question whether we are stupid, and I was thinking well, maybe we are not stupid, but we are very good at being critical about research, and then we are not good at being critical about what we consume. And this is like the kids buying the shoes with a proper name to, be, to have more social prestige. We are buying the nature article because there is prestige. So, yeah, how can we become more critical consumer of science? And maybe is it something to think about, not just to make open access to look good, but also to, uh, yeah, to make the more traditional publishing for profit to look bad. So to add a bit of shame to us, to change the way we, we make our choice. Two seconds comment. So for me, this is an opportunity to clean up the system, remove the pollution, remove the incentives that have nothing to do with science. All the movement that you're, uh, you're witnessing now, it's really a historical movement. It doesn't come up every two years. So just be aware that there's an opportunity to make the system better. And if you don't take it, then don't blame us for spending 40, 45 years of your career with an old corrupt system that you were not able to change. It's in your hands. It's as serious as this. Thank you very much. And with this, we conclude this panel discussion. Thank you for, to the panelists. I, 20 seconds. I would like, I would like to thank uh, ICOCI and the COCOS program for have, to, to have made this possible, supporting this initiative. The University of Vienna Faculty of Physics to, to have hosted, that, giving us the venue. The other organizers, the panelists again, you who are here, uh, Christiane Loza, Valiente Kron, who helped organizing this. And uh, these, uh, stay tuned on our website because we will organize more events. I hope you were not satisfied with the event of today because it means that uh, you, you learn something, you're angry now, and there is something to change. So this must be brought to the level of the academics. We should, as academics, take care of this. Many of us, until a few months ago, didn't know about Plan S, and, and this will uh, afflict uh, severely the way we will do science in the, in the next years. So we should be aware and we should be, take part in the policy making as well. Thank you very much again.